Okay, and so pull up that worksheet you've been filling out for Assyria, Persia, and China. Once you're there, you two can partner up, and the girls partner up. Yes, uh, boys, you take Assyria, talk with each other about how the Assyrians ruled, how they treated the conquered people, their forms of government, and then girls, you two, talk about Persia, same thing, uh, like their form of government, the way they ruled conquered people, the way they treated people. Think about the themes we've been talking about. For each one, think about the themes, methods of control, government. Okay, so yeah, between each other, try to cover those four themes that we talked about. These two, very similar, very connected. And then share with me after you talk about it. Alright, chronologically we start with Assyria. So Wade and Blaine. How are the Assyrians uh, maintaining control? Force. Force theory. What type of government they have? Absolute monarch, and those absolute monarchs, they love to use force theory in Assyria, right? How does slavery play a role in Assyrian society? They enslaved people that they conquered. Yep, they, they would generally enslave conquered peoples. When it comes to conflict and diplomacy, connects back to force theory, right? They have the ability to exert force over conquered people. So, what you know when you when you work diplomatically, that's trying to get someone or, or a country or an individual to do something that they wouldn't normally want to do. That's kind of what diplomacy is. You're trying to work with them to get them to make a concession. You might have to make a concession in order for them to do something. Why do you need to do that if you can just conquer them and destroy them? Because the Assyrians, remember, they have the best army of the time. They're the first army to use um, iron tool or iron weapons and, and iron armor for the first time. So they use conflict much more. Switch over to per uh, yeah, Persia. Girls. Uh, how does Persia compare to Assyria and their methods of control?
How about the type of government? Absolute monarch. He still has absolute authority. But unlike the Assyrian kings, the Persian kings, they think, hey, we have absolute power, but it's better to treat people better uh, because that way they'll be happier and they won't have reasons to uprise against us. The Persians, are some of the, the first, like the first empire that we would say gave human rights to their people. You have the right to your freedom, your religion, your language. That was pretty monumental at the time. This has kind of been what generally happened. The, the Assyrians did it more than anyone else, but that was pretty common. The Persians do things differently. So, how does slavery in Persia compare to slavery in Assyria? Yeah, they slavery existed. but not as widespread. Most importantly, are they enslaving conquered peoples? Not like the Assyrians did. They're giving more freedom to those people. So, when it comes to conflict diplomacy, how are the Persians acting? More diplomatically, They are acting more diplomatically, <coughs> just like slavery though, conflict still exists. Right? How about uh, either of you, or either group, what was, who was the, uh, the other global power that the Persians ran into and they started using a lot more conflict against? The Greeks. Right? They had problems with the Greeks. Um, They had problems with the Greeks, which uh, forced them to start using more conflict. But they eventually get into a huge war with the Greeks that really goes on for a few decades. Uh, and it does not end well for the Persians. They lose at the Battle of Thermopylae, they lose at the Battle of Marathon, then they lose a very important naval battle at Salamis, and that really is when Greece supplants Persia as the world's power. And then Persia is always on the retreat from there. And then over 100 years later, there's Alexander the Great, one of the world's greatest conquerors. He's a Greek, and he conquers the entire Persian Empire. All right, so you're clear on that. That is really everything that's testable when looking at these cultures. Okay, now we're going to China. Uh, so, I want to jump in with the, the Zhu Dynasty, also known as the Chu Dynasty, uh, that begins in 1046 BC. So, think back to that uh, part when we covered the Bronze Age and the Bronze Age Collapse. Bronze Age, Age Collapse is about 1200 BC to 900 BC. So, the uh, Zhu come to power during that time period, but we're in China. This is basically a completely different world than the Middle East at the time. These guys did not really participate in the Bronze Age like uh, those earlier civilizations, Egypt, uh, Mesopotamia, uh, the Mycenaeans, the Minoans. They're not involved. They are across the Asian continent in their own little world. The first Chinese dynasty, which we covered, um, you know, earlier, like before the Bronze Age, you had the Zai, the Shang, those are the two dynasties we talked about briefly when we covered China. So the Zhu Dynasty is the first one that I want to look more closely at. They came up with this idea of the mandate of heaven. So, next thing I want you to do, uh, go into the into Google Classroom. I just linked something, and it's under the mandate of heaven. It's just a very brief overview of what the Mandate of Heaven was. I want you to read that, and we'll answer some questions, talk about what the Mandate of Heaven exactly was, uh, and what was included in it. 
be a pretty short read. I'll start with you. Uh, what does the mandate of heaven, who does it say should rule over China? The mandate is it's kind of like that social the idea of a social contract, right? Uh, the, the emperor, he has to keep the peace in his land, otherwise he shouldn't be emperor. And then also, though, he's who gives him the right to rule? Uh, but the God, right? Very similar to some of those Middle Eastern uh, countries or empires at this time, is the uh, the ruler is claiming their legitimacy from God. But what makes mandate of heaven a little bit different is it, I would say, almost kind of combines divine right theory and social contract theory that not only do they have they get their legitimacy from the gods, uh, they have to follow the gods, but they also have to maintain uh, a level of stability and peace in the country. That kind of goes back to social contract theory. So Blaine, uh, in these ancient times, generally you inherited your role as king from your father, usually, right? The, king, the king's son becomes the next king, does that have to happen under the mandate of heaven? Do you have to be of noble birth? No. So mandate of heaven was also very different from what was happening in the Middle East because in the Middle, in the Middle Eastern Empire, say like Egypt or, or um, Babylonia, uh, Assyria, um, well, Babylonia would be a very good example of Hammurabi. You know, Hammurabi said... Uh, my right to rule comes from the king, but he's still going to pass the kingship on to his son. Here in China, uh, they're looking for someone uh, who 
doesn't necessarily have to be of what they call noble birth. They're looking for a righteous man who will rule. They're still going to rule as like an emperor, um, but he doesn't have to be someone who is of noble birth. Um, does it talk about Amber, the reason why they wanted to come up with the mandate of heaven? Kind of history that led to it. Um, I, I guess what I can't remember if it was in that in that um, doctrine or not, but it kind of the reason the Chinese came to doing the mandate of heaven was. Um, they had a lot of dynasties that came and went. So, like you can see from the timeline here, you have the Zai dynasty, the Shang, the Zhu. There'd be these dynasties, and then the, the emperors become too powerful, and they would not uh, rule justly. And then they, China would fall into a state of decline and chaos. And then uh, a new emperor would rise up, and he'd be a good emperor, and he'd unite China. And then they'd have some good emperors for a while but then they would fall back into not so good for So the Chinese began to see the cycle and they wanted to break away from it. So there's um, the Chu Dynasty. It's called the Zhu or the Chu. That's the best map I can find. It's superimposed on um, the modern borders of China. So it was a relatively large uh, empire at the time, and it lasted from 1046 BC to 256 BC. All right, um, now I'm going to play a video on the Mandate of Heaven. Hopefully, it'll explain a little more about the, like the history I was talking about. To them, time, as revealed in the movements of the stars and planets, was a truly portentous dimension, full of danger as well as auspiciousness, and especially for the rulers. For they knew that in time, the planets would reveal heaven's judgment on their earthly rule. And eventually, heaven did make its judgment. After five centuries, the last Chun King, Di Xin, came to the throne, and he would never be forgotten. In the end, the last of the Shang Kings turned into a monster. He became a wicked villain like characters in the fairy tales. And anybody who argued with him, he had put to death. When his most honest counselor tried to make him behave better, the wicked queen ordered the counselor's heart to be cut out. And then, with the people despairing of his cruelty, in the heavens they saw a sign. Five planets clustered together in a small corner of the sky. Heaven had spoken. That five planet conjunction happens every 516 years. So we asked the astronomers of Beijing Planetarium to help us find the day when the gods turned against the Shun. It's usually very hard to find exact dates this far back, but as the ancient Chinese recorded this rare planetary gathering, now we can do it. I suppose what historians always want to do is actually go back in time. Mr. Liu can do it for us. He can actually take us back to late May 1058 BC on his computer system. So you can follow any single planet. One home, this grid, the sky. The sign in the heavens was also seen by the tribes who lived under the Shan tyranny. 
and they made an alliance under a man known for his virtue, King Wen of the Zhou. And then came another omen. A huge red bird landed on the altar of the earth on Mount Ju, and it spoke. Heaven has commanded that the king of the Shang must be overthrown. Finally, on May the 23rd, 1046 BCE, Dixin, the last king of the Shang, bowed to the will of the ancestors. And in the end, all the king's enemies gathered and brought an army against his royal palace. And then he realized that he lost the favor of the gods, or as the Chinese call it, the mandate of heaven. And all his allies deserted him. And in his palace and his royal city went up in flames. He put on his precious jade suit and he walked into the tunnel. That was the end of the Shang Dynasty. And so the mandate of heaven passed to the king of the Zhou, and he laid down the pattern of rule for future ages. Rulers must be virtuous and keep harmony between humanity and the cosmos, observing the rituals and the music of the heavens. So in Chinese history, what they experienced was these different dynasties. And then the dynasty would collapse, there'd be a state of turmoil, and usually that coincided with a, a, a tyrannical ruler. Like it, it talks about in the video, um, the last emperor of the Shang was like having people put to death, and they were not ruling justly, and then they started to uh, lose control. And then another thing that happens. Uh, which I should have thrown in. Oh, I thrown in this slide. Not only there's some political turmoil going on, but then the end of the Shang Dynasty, there's some natural disasters that occur, and the Chinese people they begin to think that those are signs from the gods that the ruler is not just. There was this tradition in ancient China that if there were a lot of natural disasters that occurred, it's like the gods' way of punishing the rulers. Probably the best one. Yeah. So this is the the, the Chinese called the dynastic cycle that would begin to occur. If you have a new dynasty that rises up, they bring peace, um, they give land to peasants, they protect people, they rule quite justly. Then as that dynasty becomes more powerful, they begin taxing too much, they stop protecting the people, they treat people unfairly. In the video I talked about the emperor having people put to death. Then the people become unhappy. They would say that that dynasty's lost the mandate of heaven, and you have a lot of problems. Um, sometimes those problems can be political, leading to the downfall of the dynasty, very similar to what happened in Egypt. And then when the uh, Shang dynasty <coughs> fell, there were natural disasters that occurred along with it that made the Chinese think that. You know, this dynasty no longer has the mandate of heaven. All right, pull, go pull up those uh, worksheets that we've been working on, and we'll, find, we'll fill out the China portion.
So if this is the mandate of heaven, right, and they're getting their right to rule from the gods, which theory does that sound a lot like? If we look at our four different political theories. Divine right theory. But then also, I, I should have thrown this in there in the PowerPoint. A part of that mandate of heaven is they have to maintain peace and stability in their country. Which one of the theories does that sound more like? So I would say there's some elements of divine right theory and social contract theory that you can find in the mandate of heaven. government. Uh, we, we refer to it, them as the emperor of China, the king of China. So if you're an emperor or a king, what are you? You're uh, a monarch, an absolute monarch. But what was different, Ashley, what was different about the monarchs in China compared to those monarchs from the Middle East. If you were a monarch from the Middle East, you came to power because usually your father had been the king, right? Mm -hmm. like, they don't have to be what we call from noble birth. Um, I would say what the Chinese are looking for is a righteous ruler. Doesn't have to be someone from the nobility. Slash diplomacy. Um, we look at that cycle. How do you think slavery and conflict would fit in there? Like, let's look at the first box. Under the, can you guys read that really well? I know it's kind of fuzzy. Under the first box, there you got the new dynasty. Bring peace. Uh, gives land to the peasant, protects people. You think slavery and conflict are going to become more common or less common under that new dynasty bond? Queen and Camber. Less, less common because it looks like the emperor is treating those people better, right? Um, conflict is probably less common. Slavery. I'll, I'll always say it. slavery it always exists in almost all ancient cultures. So there's going to be some aspect of slavery in the culture, but it's probably going to be much less widespread. Then, as time goes on, that that dynasty becomes more powerful. But what happens to the people? Actually, what ha if the the dynasty is becoming more powerful? What happens to the people that really know? when we get to the old dynasty. The people that are being ruled, oh. how, what, what's happening to them? They're not happy. Why not? Treated 
bad, talks about taxes, treats people unfairly, all right? Then you would you probably see like that peasant class that had been given land before, they may be um, kind of like demoted to more of a status of slavery in that society. Well then, when these people are being treated like this, what does that lead to? Conflict and diplomacy. Conflict. The people revolt. It's like a lot of times it would be like a peasant revolt. So that leads to your problems. Peasant revolt. Alright? So if we look at slavery and then conflict and diplomacy for China, what's the experience in China? You could say, um, New Dynasty, people are more free, the Dynasty becomes more powerful. People lose freedom. So then, when, when you're looking at conflict and diplomacy, and uh, the experiences that the Chinese had through this period, um, what can we say? What would, what would be the best way to describe that? Maybe, um, Four rulers cause more conflict. The mandate of heaven. All right, so that, that graphic organizer is all filled out, right? I don't think I have created like a submission spot for it. So just, um, just save it and hold on to it and I'll create a submission box for it. Put that in.